Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of my favourite people and some of the world's biggest stars. And we've got one for you today, a lady who is hysterical. Jenny Eclair, how are you? You've managed to snare one. You've snared a D-grade celebrity in South London. <laughs> how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing all right, actually. I'm preparing. I'm preparing for a new tour. Um, well, not a new tour. I've, I'm sort of in tour hiatus at the moment because I started... Uh, the new show How to Be a Middle-Aged Woman open brackets without going insane close brackets um, last September toured up until the beginning of December and then had had all of December and January off so very rusty go back on tour in a couple of weeks February the 5th and tour for 40 dates straight through and then I go on another tour, which is the Grumpy Old Women Fifty Shades of Grey tour, which starts in about April and goes through to June. How many shows back in will it be before you remember the act as well as you could the last time you did it? Well, I'll be I'll be prepared uh, because you know there's a real saying: fail to prepare, prepare to fail. And I don't like I don't like going on stage sort of groping around the words and not knowing what to do or sort of uh, no. I'm I liked I will be on it. I'll spend a week before the first show going over and over and over it. I will even sort of rehearse it, kind of. Mm. What are you? Are you the person who looks in the mirror and does it, or do you just sit at the desk doing it in your head? I think anything more off-putting than putting, looking in the mirror. I'd be so distracted. I'd be noticing beard hair and all sorts of things that need doing. Uh, no, I go, through, I go through it sort of with notebooks and pens and underlining and sort of quite schoolgirlish, really. Uh, so middle-aged schoolgirl, quite a sort of horrible sight, really, mm. vision to put in your head. No, I find it mildly erotic, to be honest uh, with you, no, Jen. It's quite horrible, really. <laughs> um, but th- that's how I do it. And um, when it comes to the Grumpy Old Women show, that's more organised. That's a rehearsal room and a director shouting. Mm. Uh, but you can't really direct stand-up. It doesn't work. So it's just me going over and over and over it. We'll take this one by one. Firstly, the last time I spoke to you was in Nottingham. I think it was at the Playhouse and you were on tour and we were in that dressing room with that grubby bed that every star since 1976 has slept on. Can you imagine the DNA on that thing? Yes, the the soiling (laughs) of that dressing room bed. (laughs) The uh, Nottingham Playhouse, they sort of were redone in probably the 70s or the 80s uh, at a very, very particular time. So... Uh, even the toilet doors shriek of a period and uh, well, not that kind of period, a period <laughs> of time. Uh, but you know there's quite a lot of stainage around and in the, each dressing room these drop down beds that disappear into wardrobes I think it's a fantastic idea genuinely especially if you're doing one night stands just to be able to have somewhere where you can lie down mm. but you do need a rubber sheet really because God knows what's gone on down there before I got there but I don't think the sheets or the mattresses or anything has ever been cleaned mm. since the beginning of time. They're kind of Jurassic. <laughs> yeah, it's, they're disgusting. It does set the tone for the show, though, and then you can get on with it. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, I've kind of got myself soiled up, ready for my own word <laughs> and performance. I was watching TV over Christmas and there was one of those the world's best comedians ever and there you were on it pretty high in the chart when you see that does that give you any sort of sense of fulfilment or the fact that you've made it or do you just think it's a fluke how do you view yourself well you know all those kind of things are so trumped up and you know it depends whose agents had lunch with whom the week before and all that kind of rubbish and they slide them around and it's all so old anyway it's such ancient footage that it actually bears no meaning to real life and what comedy's doing at the moment. I think it's about 10 years old. I think, I think the first time I heard about it, I was, I was quietly chuffed. But it lists and chart positions are, are kind of the quickest way to madness. I had a, a fabulous week um, about 10 days ago when I got a phone call saying that I was in the Sunday Times uh, top 10 bestsellers with a new novel. And I, I really got a buzz out of that. But, you know, the next week I dropped out. You have these fleeting moments of, of success. But if you take any time to enjoy them, if you sort of for a moment take your foot off the pedal and go, well, that is it. Well done, me. You know, the next thing you get is a slap in the face. It's, it's so... Any success is 
for me is, is usually so fleeting or comes with kind of a lot of paranoia yeah. and it's almost hardly worth it I find you of all the people I've interviewed and met one of the most real and that's why we love you you seem to put more on the table than most and even when we look at the poster for this new tour there aren't many people who'd be willing to stand on the front cover of a book magazine poster front of a theatre in their underpants Jenny what's going on? They're not underpants they're knickers well. it's not like wearing the old man's pants <laughs> um, they are a fine pair black marks <laughs> size 14 I've I can't, I can't tell you how old they are, probably a couple of years. I like the furry bits on your slippers as well. There are Ugg slippers that were a gift from a neighbour who bought them for his wife and they were the wrong size. <laughs> and rather than take them back to the post office, he bought them out of my house. So you're five. I said, yes, I am. <laughs> and he gave me these Ugg slippers, which are, I can... I can honestly say the most comfortable slippers. That's so middle-aged and middle-class, isn't it? Handing it is, over it gifts. Is. I love it. And I didn't even have to buy them. And then he died. So every time <laughs> I put the slippers on, I think of him. And what fun. He was enormous fun. Uh, so that's... The, everything sort of has a tiny bit of a story. Um, even though I'm hardly wearing any clothes, the things that I am wearing are sort of quite dear to me. Do you mind? I mean, when you do that, it's very funny, and I know the point you're trying to make, and it perfectly illustrates the tour, but it is brave. You do know that, don't you? Um, no, not really, because I don't equate that sort of thing with, with bravery. I just think it's, it, in some respects, it's showing off, because I, I really genuinely don't care. Um, and I think that, you know, my, I've got a sturdy little body that just carries me around. And I get so bored of vanity and I get so bored of the, the sort of, oh, you know, the post-faceness and the sort of let's not drink and let's not eat and let's just exercise. And um, although there's a bit of me that is toying with the idea of going to the gym this afternoon, so even I'm kind of mixed up with it. We're all a bit confused about how we want to live and, and who we want to be. And I think that the only thing I, I genuinely know about comedy is that vanity doesn't work in comedy at all. You can't be vain and funny unless you're uber, uber vain and mm -hmm. it's part of a sort of caricature. Yeah. Um, but it, on the whole, if you're sort of being a, a, an observational, true-to-yourself comic, then vanity can't really come into it. Um, yeah, I was slightly taken aback when I first saw them because I was sent this contact sheet over the um, internet and I, I had to clutch my desk for a moment because, of course, you know, in your head, <laughs> it's not quite like that. And, and it, was, it was a bit of a, oh, gosh, right then, this is the reality of what I look like. Um, and, but once I got over it, I just thought, well, what a dear little face. <laughs> <laughs> and your lipstick's and, wonderful and nails. I and mean. I, I look so much like my dad. And my dad died a year ago. And he used to make me laugh so much. And genuinely, every single photograph I've had taken since he died, I, I look like him in a dress. Do you know what I love about you is you're so real and warm and you can't buy the charm you have on stage. You have that ability to say the muckiest things or the hardest things and they come across hysterical with the warmth. Was that always the case that you had a cheekiness about you? Because the, your lines delivered by the wrong person would just be offensive and not funny. Well, <laughs> Sometimes I strive for offensive. Um, <laughs> I, I think that that is to do the practice and, and you know, I, I, creating a groove for yourself and hoping that people start to fall in with your line of thinking. And what's nice about being older in this industry is that you do shake off the, the disbelievers. You know, there, there's a certain section of society that will never like what I do, that, you know, are always going to be mortally wounded and offended and disgusted, etc. But they know that that's going to happen, so they tend to avoid my stuff. And it's easier because I'm getting an audience that want to hear that kind of thing, that are on that kind of wavelength. Are you into other comedians right now who just stand on stage and talk about their day and they got up and this happened and that happened? Because you have punchlines. That's the other thing I love about your show. It's snappy, it goes somewhere, it's got a point and it moves along. I quite like them. I think they work. I think they're kind of, that's when you know a joke's over. Me too. But I don't see enough comedy at the moment. And I, I quite like seeing stuff that's very different from what I do. Um, and I, I tend to sort of have a splurge of comedy in the summer when I go up to Edinburgh or 
uh, all the Edinburgh, the hit Edinburgh shows come down to London, um, and you know I'll I'll have a, a, a snoop about. Um, but I, I think comedy is in good hands at the moment. I think there's a lot of really good people around. I do think that it's huge though, and because it's such a massive industry now, there's quite a lot of stuff that isn't my cup of tea. But that's cool because it's someone else's cup of tea, and I I, I think that there's a lot more variety. Um, and I quite like quite off the wall stuff, but I don't like mine. Um, <laughs> but it, um, you know, it's it's. I mean, I think that the, the most shocking show I saw in comedy last year was Kim Noble's. Um, it's performance art more than comedy, and it's basically the, the, the most. It's it's kind of depression and madness writ large, wrapped in comedy, but not much comedy. The comedy's quite thin. And I, I can kind of take that because I quite like being dragged to quite dark places with my comedy. Yeah. But I know that there would be some people that would see that kind of show and just think, well, where are the laughs? Mm. Uh, but I think the laughs are within the despair, sort of, because <laughs> I think, you know, if you're prepared, if you want proper honesty, you know, he goes so much further than I do. Mm. Uh, but then just as, as much, I, I don't mind seeing a proper gagsmith who can tell gags. Yeah, I love that. And that's what I love about you. You're the master of it. And truly, I think you are the greatest female comedian we've ever had in England, purely because of your delivery and your timing and your confidence. Are you crying on the inside? I mean, is there a weak Jenny Eclair or are you really that? Jenny Eclair, of course there is, yes. But, you know, um, and, you know, everybody's got that. I think that everybody's got the sniveller, the internal sniveller. Yes. Um, and uh, comedy attracts uh, well, I don't know whether it does so much more uh, these days. I think that, you know, when I w- was doing, um, I think the sort of heyday of stand-up for me, 90s, whatever, there was there were, were quite a lot of quite broken people doing it, you know. Um, it was, because it was a rickety-rackety business back then, it's a lot more corporate now, and there are, you know, there are classes and courses that people can do to be a stand-up comic. <laughs> um, but I, I do think, and I, I belong much more in the sort of, circus freak show kind of area of it rather than suit tie after dinner you know that sort of arena yeah, thank god um, you do as well well I think that you know there's, there's room for everybody well no there isn't actually I don't mean that at all um, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's a tricky one because I I, I still do stand up a lot but I do do other things as well now and I think that uh, that's healthy for me. I think that writing is a good thing for me to do. I think I have to step away from stand up now and again because there's nothing more fun, frustrating than not being able to write a punchline. And I do get quite poisonous and, and start sort of mentally beat myself up if I'm not on joke writing form. And if you're writing other things, yeah. you could be kind to yourself because you don't have that demand for the, you know, the gag. So you can, you know, like writing radio shows or, or books. Um, you can get stuck into a story rather than the the gag, the yeah. gag, which is quite a bossy thing. And you did really well. I mean, Moving was a big success, amazing reviews. Are you going to be doing more writing? Moving was the fourth novel, and I think that um, I, they're, they're, they're massive mountains novels, and that I don't, I haven't quite got the energy to even look at another mountain at the moment. <laughs> I feel a bit sick because uh, everyone. I, that's another thing people think they're, they're a bit like turning taps on and off just, if you've written one novel people think there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't just get on and write another one and for me it doesn't work like that it's a very odd process I have to have an idea before I start but I never I can never plot the whole book out before I start it's kind of a weird mix of semi-knowing some characters in a place and then mm. hoping that they all sort of you know have a conclusion yeah um, but it's I'm not ready yet well again I mean the Sunday Times bestseller list is no bad place to be that's what I mean about the writing the, just getting away from having to write comedy yeah um, is, is sort of a relief because I physically like writing I like sitting in a, a study and actually sort of getting in there yeah. and getting sort of quite stuck in and quite um, involved with other people the, the characters mm. um, and I, I think I, I need to do a bit of a mixture of both. 
It was interesting. I said to you last time we spoke that I think where you're at your best is when you're just talking off the cuff and being you. And an opportunity to do that was Loose Women, which you did for a while. You don't do it anymore. Will we see you back on that? Because you were excellent. I wonder whether you were too good on that show. I think that... Uh, I don't think that... I think there was somebody quite high up who wasn't pleased with what I was doing. And I was sacked. And, uh, or they say your contract has not been re- renewed. Yes. Um, which is a polite way of saying you're sacked. Um, but it's, you know, in some respects, it was making me lazy as a, as a live performer because I didn't need to do it. I was earning nice money. The studios were quite near to my house. It was, you know, a, a great part-time job. But um, I wouldn't have done the other things if no. I hadn't been sacked. I follow you on Twitter and I love your take on the world. I wonder where the world is going for women right now. I watched Big Brother the other night on the internet, a clip of it, and it was two young girls who clearly are mentally ill, screaming and shouting. Um, I watch loose women who talk about women's rights and all this, yet as soon as they give away a prize, they bring on two muscled men and start groping them, and that's perfectly acceptable. It well, see- really depresses me. I sort of, I think that my heart died once when some firemen came on, and everybody just went ridiculous, and I just was embarrassed and ashamed. It yeah. seems like we're in a funny time for women. There are people like you who go out and do it brilliantly and don't need doors opening because you open them yourself. And then there's another side that are saying that doors need to be open just because you're a woman. It, help me with that. What's your take on it right now? I think that there's tribes. I think that what's got, what it is at the moment is the tribes are quite defined. Uh, people used to be much more in this or that, but there are, the, 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 the lines between groups of women now are quite wide. Uh, you know, you have very feminist young women who are sort of just getting on with their lives and uh, and being true to themselves and all that kind of thing, not that fussed about. I think what's interesting, to me, going back to London, I'm intrigued by how few women are wearing high heels anymore. It's as if, you know, feminism has, has gripped London and the young women that live here, and, we, and they've just gone, we don't do heels. They're not, they're stupid. We're not going to do them. Right. You know, we are walking around on public transport. We're trying to get our work done. We're trying to live in this ridiculous city. Heels don't match. And I'm really glad to see that. It's kind of, I think it's reassuring. Um, and yet, on the other hand, the media is obsessed by simpering women in heels and bikinis. And they don't represent any women that I know at all. I mean, these creatures seem only to exist in tabloid newspapers and on occasional TV programs but in real life I don't see them I, they have nothing to do with my life I don't know them Hmm. I don't know any young women like that. Again, though, I don't know what to think. I just interviewed Vicky Patterson a few weeks ago who won The Jungle. I mean, you know all about that show. Um, she was on Geordie Shore, which again seems to represent another form of humanity that's passed me by, where in Newcastle they go around sleeping with each other and everybody and they wear the high heels and very little else, and that's acceptable too. It's hard to know what's really going on, isn't it? That's what I'm trying to say. Well, yeah, it is. It is, and, and uh, there's so many mixed messages. But I do think social networking has given a lot of particularly young women a platform and a community where they, which they can cling to, which is, I think, comforting because a, a lot of young women, I think, in the past have felt like oddballs because the media hasn't really wanted to give them time, airspace, uh, because they don't look right, they're not conforming to beauty or submissiveness, so they've been ignored. So I think a lot of them have felt like they're their low voices and because of Twitter because of social networking they're finding each other across the country and they're actually sort of going actually there are more of us than you think yeah um, but I do think that the bigger media does ignore them because they find them a bit tedious because they're not they're not sort of playing the game right the game's not going to be played for very much longer well, it's interesting here in America, the two biggest stars are both female. Oprah Winfrey and Ellen DeGeneres have the biggest shows. I wonder in England what it's like for you as a woman. Do you think there still is uh, the issue of less pay and less opportunities in the media? Or has it some- somehow made itself right now? Is it getting better? I think it's getting better. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I'm not talking from the top of the tree. Uh, I think that, that women who are right at the top of the tree um, you know, you have people like J.K. Rowling. Uh, she's not she, she's not suffering. Uh, it's suck, huge success transcends um, anything any, anything to do with you know whether you're a man or a woman. It's you are just the success story. Um, 
I do think that further down in the line, yes, there are some uh, inequalities, but less and less. Um, it's just, I think it's just sustaining a, a career and, and, and trying to, yeah, just trying to maintain enough money to have a nice lifestyle. And I don't, I don't know because I'm not kind of in any any group. I don't do television. I don't have a radio show. I don't. I'm not really one of the book writers. I sort of float around. So I'm I'm not an expert on any one thing. I love to hear you on Radio 4 on those comedies. In my opinion, you're a pioneer who has done nothing but greatness for comedy and for what you do. Um, I'm a huge fan. Jenny Eclair's How to Be a Middle-Aged Woman, brackets without going insane, uh, is on tour now. You can see her from February all over the country. Well, basically, you're going to be everywhere, aren't you? Between uh, Everywhere, like a rat. There you go, between now and the end of March. And then Grumpy's back. We always love that. Every year you turn up in our towns and you just make us laugh. It's a lovely show, that, isn't it? Yeah, it's good fun. I mean, it's a, it's a real crowd pleaser, that one. So, yes, and then I'm going to have take stock over the summer and decide what to do next. Thank you so much for your time. I'm a huge fan. Jenny Eclair is one of my favourite people. You can find out all the tour dates by going to her website. Just put in Jenny Eclair and it comes up. Great to talk to you, Jenny. Nice talking to you. Get back to that sunshine. <laughs>